Several questions came in from the audience yeah, today when great. I said that we were going to meet. One of them was, I want to start a venture capital fund. How do I do it? All right, we are live and I am excited. I'm here with one of my favorite people in New York City, Bradley Tusk. Bradley, hey. thanks for the time today. Thanks for, thanks for, coming, for coming on the show. Sure. Um, lots of exciting things to talk about with you. Yeah. For the people that are watching now, you know, our audience is largely entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. 18 to 35 years old. Yeah. They're trying to figure out a couple different things. Number one, uh, how do they build a business? Yep. And number two, once they start to build a business, how do they grow that business? Yep. And so just a little bit of background about Bradley for people that don't know. Uh, we actually met back in oh, 2009. Yeah. Bradley ran Mike Bloomberg's reelection campaign for mayor of New York City. Um, successfully yeah and, worked and I worked on the campaign and became very fond of both the mayor and Bradley uh, I'll never forget that every single morning you sent out an email at like five o'clock yeah morning. to Mike yeah every yeah. day at five every single day at five in the morning and it's funny it ended up a few things one is because Mike doesn't really love politics in some ways for him I was like okay I know what's going on I know they're on top of it I'll go about my day being mayor and I'll deal with them as, as needed to during the uh -huh. day uh, but also, I stole that approach, and we've never stopped doing it. So every portfolio company, every really? client, anyone we work with now at 7 a.m. and not 5, I don't send it anymore myself, but you know, 30 some odd emails go out every single morning. That's um, amazing. Saying, here's what's going on. And it does a few things. I mean, one is clients love it, right? Yep. They wake up and there it is. Yep. Two, um, it sets an agenda that everyone can basically agree to and work off of for that mm -hmm. day. And three, as a management tool, you know, obviously you see it on everything, so I know by 7 a.m. what's going on with every single issue every single day. That's amazing, that's amazing. And so that's you know, a little gem for you guys that are running companies. The, the other thing, so you've had an extensive background in politics, uh, you've had, now you run and founded Tusk Holdings, which does all kinds of incredible work with startups trying to navigate the political world. You are now an author, congratulations Thank on you. the book, The Fixer. Uh, I've read part of it, I think it's fantastic. If you are a startup, that is trying to think through how to navigate the world of disruption. This is a book for you. And we're going to talk more about the book during the conversation. But Bradley, tell us a little bit about the two to three minute origin story, who you are, where you come from, how sure. you ended up here uh, founding Tusk Holdings for the yeah. people that are watching that so, don't know who you so are. So real quick story. So I worked in government politics for the first chunk of my career. Obviously, yep. we worked together in 09. And Mike's campaign, I spent about four years in Illinois as the deputy governor of the state couple of years on Capitol Hill as Chuck Schumer's communications director, started my first company in 2010, which is a consulting firm that runs big campaigns for big companies. So let's say you're Expedia and the hotel industry is trying to pass new taxes on, on my travel booking in 12 different states. We'll figure out how to stop it and feed it back in each state. Mm -hmm. And I'm sitting in a Walmart meeting in 2011 and Sheiky calls, a uh, guy got, got Bloomberg guy named Kevin Sheiky. He said, hey, there's a guy with a small transportation startup. He's having some regulatory problems. Would you mind talking to him? All right, sure. Next thing I know, I'm Uber's first political advisor. Then I got really lucky because Travis calls me back and says, I can't afford your fee. Would you take equity? And that guy said, yes. <laughs> to be clear, I didn't know what I was saying last year, right? I didn't know I knew Uber's going to come Uber. I didn't even really know what equity meant. That's awesome. Uh, but I said yes. Um, and then spent the next five years just beating the shit out of the taxi industry all over the U.S. Um, so the ride sharing could happen. And it did. And initially, it was like, hey, this is one, really fun. And two... Look how lucrative this is. Not quite realizing that Uber is in the middle of the phenomenon, right? So I'd go to other founders and I would say, hey, here's who you're disrupting. Here's their political power. Here's what they're going to do to you. Here's how you can push back. And I'll do it for you. And I'll do it for equity. Well, um, but until startups start taking politics a little more seriously, the typical response I would get was like, no, no, no. You don't get it. I went to Stanford. I was in Y Combinator. John Doerr's on my board. And when that stupid regulator sees how brilliant I am, they're going to do whatever I want. And I'm like, I'm pretty you're, sure Paul. You're delusional. Delusional. Doesn't work like that. <laughs> but then after Uber and Airbnb and others had enough fights, startups started realizing, okay, I have to deal with this stuff. Yep. So we used that to launch Touch Ventures in 2015. Two-part venture business. We invest in startups and regulated industries, and then we work with those startups to solve their political problems. So... Portfolio include companies like Bird, where we've been invested since the Series A, mm -hmm. or running campaigns all over the U.S. to legalize electric scooters. Uh, Coinbase, Circle, Lemonade, Roman, Carev, Nexar, Fanduel, whole bunch of companies. Uh, where you know, like every VC, we're looking at the TAM, the founder, and the underlying tech and the idea. But then we're also looking at: is there some sort of political obstacle that if we can solve it? 
can really expedite growth massively. And that's if, if it can, that's when we jump yeah. in. So a couple interesting things here that, that I think are very cool about your career is that you, you know, people always say, how do I find my thing? You know, how do I find the thing that I should be doing? I have all these experiences. They seem like they're unrelated. And I always say, look for the intersection, which is exactly what you've done, right? You've, you have an extensive government background, yep. a political background, and you actually worked for politicians yep. for many, many, many years and big time positions for big time politicians. So you saw all of it. Um, and then you went on to say, so there are all these politicians here that I have experience working with. There are all these companies here that I'm advising or investing in, and the intersection is where do the where does the political world meet the entrepreneurial world? Well, in a lot of cases, these political folks, this political world, is the reason that you may or may not be as successful as you want as an entrepreneur, sure. right? Yeah. And so Absolutely. you built you literally built a company around that, which yeah. is which is really cool because it's bringing these two worlds together. So tell us a little bit about. You know these these companies that you invest in right mm -hmm. now, because everybody wants to know how do I get funding. Yep, that's the big question right now. As someone that runs a venture capital fund, what are the two or three things that you look at before yeah. investing in a company? So one is the idea, right? Yep. It's got to be. We we invest typically Series A, sometimes even C. So we want to potentially make a ten x on every investment. Um, our average check size is about a million dollars, and uh, we're looking. Is this a big enough idea? That if we invest a million, we can get back ten million. Maybe not for seven years. We're, yep. we're patient-ish, yep. but um, that's number one. Number two, how big is the market? Obviously, uh, and I will say is one quick piece of advice to people watching this: um, you want to show a big market, but it's got to be legitimate enough because sometimes people come. It in can't with be China. like everyone's going to buy a shirt. Yeah, and then what happens is I discount everything else in the data, totally. everything else in the presentation. So like, there's a fine line between being ambitious and aggressive. And not overselling if your market to, right. size is the whole world, yeah, you're it's done. not real. You're exactly. Done. Yeah, so, yeah. but the TAM, um, a lot about the founder, right? There are bets that we've made where they're basically just founder bets where it's like, I really believe in this company. Like the, you know, the wing, uh, Audrey Gelman, it's like this women's networking space. No, no, I don't know. Anyway, like she, five years ago, had this idea. And now it's like NEA is back to like the massive amount of money. Cool. But I was like, I have no idea if this is a good idea or not. What do I know about women's networking spaces? But I really believe in Audrey. Yep. I've worked with her before in politics. Yep. Founders bet has paid off exceptionally well. Um, so part of it is, do we really believe in this person? And are they both, and I, kind of two pieces. Are they visionary enough to, to conceive of this big idea? Yep. And then are they tactical and relentless enough to actually execute it, right? Yep. And you need both. There are people who are really good at thinking of stuff, but they're not great at doing stuff. And people who are really good at doing what they're told, but they can't kind of come up with the strategy and the idea. Um, the people for whom we're going to deploy seven figures into, you know, they need to, be able to demonstrate both. And then for us, the other piece is, you know, what's happening on the political front. So if you're lemonade, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. as great of a product as it is, if they don't have the license to sell insurance, they can't do anything, right? So can we get them that license? If you're FanDuel, People love playing fantasy sports, but again, the state has to let you actually do it. Uh, if you're bird entering the market, Uber, so on. So a lot of it also is this product's great, but it is going to disrupt a, a traditional industry or cause a lot of political headaches. Can we solve that? Yep. And if we solve it, do we then get a really big premium on our investment because of our work and our expertise? That makes sense. It's, so that's interesting. You're actually you're investing in the kinds of companies that you can help yeah. as clients. Oh, that's cool. So so. Several questions came in from the audience yeah, today when great. I said that we were going to meet. One of them was, I want to start a venture capital fund. How do I do it? Very hard. So I will tell you, it took me two years to raise fund one. It was a relatively small fund, $37 million. And here's the challenge. I'm probably just complaining as opposed to giving an answer to the question. But well, but a complaint might be the answer. <laughs> so every LP says, I want someone with a differentiated strategy. Yep. It's not much more differentiated than, like, we're the only fund that works this intersection of tech and politics. No one else does it. For better or for worse, we're the only one. Yep. And it turns out most of them meant, like, I want a different font in the deck. Not like, I want two people who are partners in Andreessen that are starting their own fund and they have the track record. Yep. Not this political guy who says, I'm going to get all these deals that no one can get into simply because they have to have my help. And in return for my help, I've got to get investment rights. Um, so it took me two years to do it. I got really lucky finally that Amtrust, which is a giant insurance company, uh, agreed to be our, our anchor LP, uh, and that kind of got us off the races. Uh, we only did the final close of fund one just about a year ago, a little less. Mm -hmm. um, 
but we've been lucky to get into a lot of really great deals. So we've gone through most of it. The returns are great. And we're now raising fund two, uh, 70 million or so is what we're looking to do. Cool. We want to stay early stage. Um, but the answer is a few things. One is it is just hard, right? Yep. Even fund two and like IRR is like a stupid number. It's still slow, right? Why, why is that? Why do you because think? Because the people who invest in funds are usually pe- risk averse people and big institutions who have a lot of process and they don't move that fast and they have to check a lot of boxes. And to a certain extent, you can push them, but you have to go through their process. Yep. And I'm working at warp speed on everything all the time. I know you are. And, you know, they're just <laughs> my favorite thing about slow, you. you know? <laughs> so, like, that's frustrating. And even with the returns we have, we still could work. We're getting there. We'll raise the amount of money we want to raise for fund two, but it's definitely slower than I would like it to be. Yep. Um, that's one. Two is assuming that you're not a former you know person from Sequoia or a cell. If you are, then you're not. You know, you didn't ask that question. You're right. Ahead, totally. Right? Um, if you don't have the track record to bring over, you really do have to demonstrate how you can bring something to the table that is so unique and so different that they're really missing out. By not investing, most of them will still say no. Most of them still said no to us, but without being able to show that, like, look, we're the only people with this vision and the ability to actually execute it, nobody would invest in. Cool. So I want to get into the book in a second, but yeah. there, there, just a, a leadership question that came in is, how much do you micromanage your team, and I, how I, much do you I delegate? Don't. So I delegate a lot. Um, and what's the but, key? Because a lot of people really yeah. struggle with delegation. Yeah. So, right? so keep in mind, my, the way this business evolved was it was just me and remember Shelly Capital? Yeah, sure. Me and Shelly on day one. And it was really only us for like the first year. Really? So for the first couple of years, even though we kept growing, mm-hmm. I was running all these campaigns myself. Mm-hmm. So I developed the templates, the systems, the strategies. And then as I brought people in, I was still running them and I was training them and how I was doing it to a point where now they think similar to how I think, and they can go out and they just run these campaigns. I'm usually involved in the strategy on the front end, dealing with problems as they come up. But on the day-to-day execution of like, did we get the permit from Texas for autonomous trucking testing? I don't have to worry about that. And you don't even think about it? Well, or... no, so there's the morning email, so I see what's going on, uh-huh. right? And then I- Who I write, writes the morning email? So the, the staff? each person who's like the campaign manager for that yep. client is yep. sending it. Yep. But then I write a 10 to 15 page memo to my team every Monday morning mm-hmm. um, that says, here's everything going on. Every mm-hmm. client, every line of business, everything we're working on. And that's team. a more high-end brand it's higher strategy. End, but yeah, but still it does, it'll get into like, here are the five things that we had to deal with this week for FanDuel or whatever it is. Um, so it, it does get granular enough that it gives me a pretty good sense of it. I do it both because I want everyone else to feel included and up yep. to speed. Um, and it's also a way for me to force myself to really dig in and focus yeah. on what's happening. And I can read, you know, look at the different issues and say, okay, I'm spotting a problem in this one or an opportunity in this one. Um, but also I've made a very conscious decision um, that I want to be able to free up as much time for myself to pursue things like writing a book or whatever else. Um, and so I pay people really well um, I pay 100% of everyone's benefits. Everyone who works here has equity in the fund. Um, cool. There are things that I do that make me less money. I run a lower margin than I could. But what I'm getting in return for are really loyal, really talented people who stay, they want to be here, they work hard, they're incentivized. Yep. And because of that, um, I have more time to do things that I want to do. So look, I'm at a place now where I can afford, if I need to make less money because I want my time back, I can afford to do that. Yep. Uh, but I, my, I would strongly encourage anyone who's in a position to do that, to say, just get the best talent you can, treat them as well as you can, and pay them as well as you, as you can, because ultimately you're gonna be happier and you're gonna come up with you know, occasionally a big idea that's gonna make you a lot more money, yep. right? Because you're not totally in the weeds. And look, obviously I stole all this from my Bloomberg, right? <laughs> you know, I basically looked at Mike and said, his management strategy works incredibly well. Here's his macro approach to it. Not all of it applies to a you know, venture capital fund or a consulting firm, whatever it is, but wherever I can, I'm gonna to try to model ourselves after that. I mean, even like here in the office, with just a bullpen and cross yep. conference room. Yep. I sit at a cubicle in the middle. And, I saw that. I yeah. was like, this, uh, this looks familiar. Yeah, I totally stole it from Mike. Yeah. I mean, even our foundation, uh, Tusk Montgomery Philanthropies, is a mix of political advocacy and philanthropy. And that really is like the model where someone like John Feinblatt or Howard Wolf's going to be running these campaigns around guns or immigration or soda taxes. Um, and Patty Harris is actually an advisor to our foundation cool. because we're basically stole the model from them. Cool. And, and yeah, so. Um, and that, yeah. that model for the employees is pay them well, make them feel like they're truly a part of yeah. the operation, and 
and and let them do their thing. Yeah, absolutely, and be yeah. be available, right? Yeah. People, I mean, you know, these people. Someone emails me, they get a response. Yeah. If they, there's something wrong with their response within like an hour or something yeah. like that. You yeah, yeah, a lot faster. So, um, response to them. We have a weekly meeting. We have the weekly memo. Make them all feel included. Give everyone a sense of what's going on. Um, but also hold people accountable, right? So I don't micromanage people, but I do hold them to a high standard. And if there are people who can't meet the standard, we move them out. We, yeah. we're, we're very generous with severance and things yeah. like that. But I understand that we keep a level of difficulty of what we're doing keeps going up and up and up every single day. And there are people for whom they just don't have the drive or the work ethic or the right set of abilities for what we need or they want a more balanced life yeah. and this is, not you know, this is not the place for that, right? Yeah. Yep. So we, do, we don't micromanage people, we don't yell at people, but we do move people out every year. Good. Yeah, that's helpful. I think a lot of people struggle with leadership uh, and, and just knowing you for the last seven years or whatever, for six years, yeah. Yeah. I just, it's been, you know, you are a high achieving you know, hyper-driven, ambitious, productive leader. And so... Which comes with its own set of psychological well, I understand. <laughs> to be clear. <laughs> I understand. But um, so let's get into the book. Yeah. So so The Fixer, um, like I said, I read part of it. It's it's fantastic. And, and, and just to be clear, I actually don't do a lot of promoting of other people's products on my... In our community, just because yeah. I don't have much time to consume other people's content. Um, but I don't even need to read any more of the book to recommend the book. Appreciate that. Because I know you so well and I respect you so much as a leader. So <clears throat> tell us a little bit about, you know, the one minute cliff note version yeah. of the book and then who should read it and why. Yeah. So the book is effectively how startups should deal with politics. So the first part of the book is how I learned how to do all the stuff. So it's war stories about working for Bloomberg or Schumer or Zogoyevich or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. The next third of the book is Uber and how Travis and I came up with the strategy to make ride sharing legal in every market in the US and how we executed it. And then the last third is Todd Ventures, and now it's case studies of working with all these different startups to help them achieve their political goals. So what we did for Tesla or FanDuel or Lemonade or Handy or Ease and so on, um, and trying to really tell through you know fun narrative stories, here's how you think about it, here's how you deal with it. Everyone's situation is always going to be different, yep. but there are some broader questions and intellectual frameworks that you can latch on to. In fact, at the end of the book, there's a whole section of like, Okay, what do I do when? And so I ask a question, and then I yes. give a bunch of advice. Cool. Um, so the idea is, look, there's 17,000 startups in the U.S. right now. I can invest in work with a dozen at any given time, mm -hmm. you know, not much more than that. So um, I want all of them to at least know how to properly think about politics, yep. how to deal with it, and there we go. Um, so that's the point of the book. So I would say if you are a startup, if you're an entrepreneur, um, if you are you know, interested in politics, or I'm, I'm suspected no one will, who watches this will subscribe to it. But if you're like a big entrenched slow interest, I would totally want this book. Uh, in fact, I won't name that like two Fortune 50 companies in the last couple weeks have asked me to come in and would I give a talk on the book? And I was yeah. kind of, that's pretty smart of them. Yeah, right? yeah, and totally. It's like, this is how you avoid being disrupted. And that's, and that's interesting because, you know, so, and it, just the first third of the book in and of itself, if you're like a human being that likes interesting stories, yeah. I think that, you know, the, of yeah, course, fun political the, stories. yeah, the last, the Some last, get me in trouble. But, yeah. <laughs> nah, I don't think so. The last half is, is definitely if you want to be, a, if you're a startup and you want to know how to handle it. But I think anyone that's just looking for some interesting stories, this is a great book. Um, last thing I, I would say that, that I would ask you is, you know, you do, I know you, you know, you run this company, you're, you run a, a, a VC fund, you're very busy, and I've, I've seen you on many different uh, news shows. Do you do a lot of speaking? Yeah, I do. Is that something that, you, that you're that you open to doing? Like if someone were watching the show yeah, right now, sure. how can they get in touch with oh, you and bring you in? Be touch at tuskholdings.com, just email me. But um, I, I do for a couple of reasons. One is, in, in the VC world, I'm trying to create a market. There was yes. no intersection of tech and politics. There was no niche for it. Till we started doing it, we've done really nicely, but we're still very early on in the ball game. So I have to constantly be out there to explain what we do, why we exist, why startups should take politics seriously, and all these other things, so that funds, other VCs, LPs, you know, startups, everyone says, okay, I need to deal with this, right? Yep. So that's one. Two, you know, we've got some big ideas we're pursuing, especially out of our foundation. Most importantly, being mobile voting, so that people can vote in elections on their phones over the blockchain. That's a pretty radical concept, totally. right? And totally. I was in Chicago this week talking about it. Then I went to like Tahoe to a conference and talking about it. And then the New Yorker's got a piece coming out Monday or Tuesday on it. And like, 
it's a lot of my time because it's a really big idea that is really threatening to everyone who has power right now. Election, wow. And I've got to use every platform I have to really try to sell it. I believe that 100%. Um, any final closing words of wisdom, advice, inspiration that you'd like to, to share well, with up and coming entrepreneurs? You know, someone asked me a question yesterday, and I was thinking about it last night, and I, I knew we were going to have this conversation, yeah. which is um, and because, especially everyone here who's a little younger, there seems to be, I think, this misnomer between following your passions and sacrificing. Okay. Right? Um, and I notice it in the inbound we get when people are looking for jobs. In fact, we now have a no Ivy League millennial hiring policy. Really? Yeah, because um, what I have found (laughs) is it's great to have passions. I have always followed my passions. And sometimes I've made lots of money. My first job out of college, I made $22,000 a year. I never really made the decisions based on that. But you gotta know how to do stuff, right? So people email me, you know, I'm a senior at Yale, uh, and I want to join your fund to help advise startups how to deal with politics. Why don't you go work in politics? Right? Have you ever worked on a campaign? No. Have you ever worked in a mayor's office, a governor's office on the Hill? No. You don't know anything, so you can't. And yeah, those are often shit jobs, and, and you got to deal with a lot of crazy people. I mean, even I had big jobs. still Rob Blagojevich was crazy. Chuck Schumer was crazy. Mike was the only non-crazy person I worked for in mm-hmm. politics. Mm-hmm. Um, so they're not mutually exclusive, right? And I think somehow this thing has come like, if you're following your passion, everything is just going to be fun and roses and easy all I the love time. That. And that's not true. Ultimately, it's all that sacrifice. And in fact, I you know, the, the book in many ways tries to capture that. And it's all that sacrifice that teaches you how to do the things that you care about so you can be really effective at it. And the thing that, the thing that I see the most from this community is that everyone thinks it's going to happen fast. I mean, you've been, you've been working your face off yeah, the last for decades, years. Yeah. decades, and you, and you, and you probably feel amazing right now, right? I, I feel great, but look, I only paid off my student loans in my late thirties, yeah. right? Um, you know, we live, we didn't have any money for a long time and that was okay. Cause what I was trying to do in a lot of my twenties and early thirties was just collect as many experiences and skills and relationships as I could with the knowledge that at some point I'd want to try to monetize in a unique way. Yep. And that's exactly what ended up happening. Yep. But it, because I put in a grueling amount of work, man, I was deputy governor of Illinois. I was working seven days a week, 15 hours a day for four years, <laughs> dealing with a sociopath and Rob Lagojevich. But man, I learned a lot. There's no way I could do what I do now without having done that. So you know, you, you just if you don't put the work in, you can't get the right outcomes, no matter how special you think you are, no matter how smart you are. That's amazing. Well, this man is certainly a visionary, certainly a pioneer, and I have really enjoyed getting to know him over the years, working with him. You know, working on the Bloomberg campaign for me was one of the best experiences to date um, because of you, because of the mayor. And uh, I'm just a huge fan, man. And so, you know, I, being, having you on the show meant a lot. Cool. Please check out the book. Uh, check out the, the podcast. Are you on social? Do you, yep, yep. You uh, on, social? Uh, on Twitter, Bradley Tusk. Bradley Tusk on Twitter. Yeah. Um, you know, and and you know, f- find a way to work with him. Find a way to bring him in to speak. Find a way to do something with him because I'll tell you, I, I interact with hundreds and thousands of people every single year. This guy is a true leader, and uh, he really walks the walk. And I have an immense respect for the amount of action that you take and the amount that you get done while still being kind. Uh, to to those people in your life. So yeah, cool. thanks for hey, coming on the show, brother. I appreciate it. The thanks Fixer for watching. with Bradley Tusk, and uh, you guys have a great day. Right. Talk to you soon. Thank you.